Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be a part of this Teacher Institute this week and to share a little bit of our ongoing oral history project with you. As I mentioned yesterday on the bus tour, the museum has uh, an active and ongoing oral history project that we've been doing here since the institution opened in 1989. We've done over 1,100 individual recordings and also all of our public and educational programs are considered part of the oral history project as well. Uh, we've talked to people from all around the world about the, their memories of President Kennedy, the life, death, and legacy of President Kennedy, and the history and culture of Dallas and the 1960s. And a big part of that is the civil rights movement. We've talked to a number of civil rights activists, including the, the gentleman seated here next to me, and we're going to um, share some stories with you, some primary resources uh, from the civil rights movement today. Uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about our oral history project, you can access um, about 150 video clips on our website, jfk.org. You can also see an entire alphabetical list of all 1,100 plus on our website as well. And if uh, any of you have memories of President Kennedy or the early 1960s that you'd like to uh, share with us, you're more than welcome to contact me and we can add your voice to this collection as well because we believe everyone has a story worth sharing. And with that, I want to introduce our guest speaker today. Here he is from 1964. <laughs> this is Clarence Broadnax, and you have a bio of him in your packet, but uh, just in brief, he was the first African-American hairstylist uh, hired by Neiman Marcus and Sanger Harris department stores, and he was the instigator of uh, what became one of the most prominent civil rights demonstrations in Dallas, the 28-day protest at the Piccadilly Cafeteria on Commerce Street. Uh, you'll, you'll hear about that today today from Clarence and uh, a lot of other things that he was involved in as a civil rights activist in the 1960s. And, uh, and Clarence, I believe uh, you told me you want to get us started today with just a little, little background about yourself. So it's, it's open for you. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I said yesterday we all got all excited and uh, a, a little story that we saw in South Dallas that kind of refreshed in my mind. It took me back. Oh, in this Juanita's Crafts Place. Uh, when I first moved to Dallas, she was one of the leaders that I first contacted. But to make a long story short, uh, I was born here in, in the city of Dallas and born in a segregated society. My mother, she birthed two kids at the old Parkland Hospital, and I was one of them. And I left as an unnamed child. I didn't get named until I was about 18 years old. <laughs> and so at that point in time, I had uh, graduated from high school, enrolled in El Central, and uh, had gone on to beauty school to get my degree in beauty culture. And uh, from there, I uh, got involved. I got active in the movement. But my father, we, we were moved from here back to East Texas at my early age. We moved back to East Texas because of the labor. My father, they could not get jobs here. And later, my father relocated back in Kernak to where he was born and raised at. And went to work for the federal government. And he, in the at that position, we had five kids. He had five kids. And my mother and father separated, had a divorce at an early age in our lives. And my mother took the oldest child with her and left five of us behind. So it took upon me to have to grow up real fast. I had to take care of the other four. I had a baby sister. Her name was Gloria, and Gloria was sickly all the time. And she had, I used to tell her all the time, I said, Gloria, you know what, you're never dealt. You got all these sores on you, and you, you know, you, I, I would tease her, told her she had leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, uh, that's how we grew up. We grew up, and it took upon me to take upon the total responsibility of the house of being the mother, the father, and the oldest brother. So, and then later I moved to Dallas. And moving to Dallas, I uh, continued my education. And that's how I got involved in, in the movement here in Dallas. 
Let's start off by uh, talking a little bit about how you came to work at Neiman's, how you became the first African-American hairstylist there. At Neiman's, Neiman's was, was, was highly segregated. And Neiman's, uh, they, for blacks, they had to always go in, in the back door and they, they could not shop up in the front of the store. And so after I graduated from beauty school, and, and, and before I get there, uh, let me give you some experience on my background at Beauty Field. When I got out of uh, Miss Roy, I was uh, walking down Ross Avenue one day and just wondering. And I looked over and there was a, a building just full of nice young ladies all in white uniforms, and I thought maybe it might have been nurses. So I said, you know, I'm going to go in there and see what's going on, and all those pretty women in there. <laughs> and so I went in, and I was just looking around, and the principal, she saw that I was curious. So when I got ready to leave, she came to me, and she asked me if I would enroll. I told her no, because, you know, they had when a man takes beauty culture, they had to be gay or something. And there were several guys back there that, you know, and I, I, I paid that no attention. So I explained to her, and so she said to me, she says, you had a personality to, if you want to, you could come and just be a shampoo guy. And you could make enough money to take you to places that you want to go. And at, at that point, I started to thinking, because when I first moved to Dallas, I was employed, but I, I got a job as a dishwasher. And that was basically what was open to blacks at that point in time, with dishwashers and, and uh, maintenance men who cleans the floor. And dishwashing just wasn't me. I, when I grew up, I was always wanting to be a lawyer or a doctor and, and be somebody. And, I was told many times that I would never amount to nothing in a way. And that was because of the separation of the family. So, but anyway, I, um, she gave me a couple of weeks. She said, call me and let me know uh, if you're interested. She said, I'm going to leave this open to you, but I wish you would take it. And two weeks passed, I hadn't called her. so. She called me back and she said, Mr. Broadnax, have you thought about what I told you? I said, of course I have. And so I, I took on to it. And that's how I got a free trip through beauty school. And after I graduated at the top of the class out of beauty school, and from there, there were two ladies that I met that took me up under their wings and we went into business together. So I was always in control of my life when it comes to employment. So what I did is when I tied the investment into the partnership, uh, the three of us, then I decided to just kind of move about the city and, and having a little money, I had the opportunities and there were places that I had seen that I really wanted to go visit and eat and sit down and, and just enjoy myself like other people were doing. And a lot, I had, I had the money that I could afford to do it, but due to the racial problem that we were having, I couldn't go in and sit down and eat and enjoy the other necessities of life as other people did. So what I did is I started then to, uh, I guess, kind of rebel and from there, I was walking down the streets one day. I said, I think I'll go in there and put in an application. And so I went in the meetings and I made the application for hairstylists. And they were very excited. They were very excited. And, and I was too. <laughs> so so I, uh, two weeks passed, a month passed. Finally, they called me. And I got interviewed by Stanley, which is the owner of Neiman's. And right away he wanted me just like that. 
And that was my story at Nemo's. I, I, after, after getting the job, I had no more problems. But they always wanted me to come through the back door. It wasn't them. It was always some of the employees or somebody. So I would just tune it out, go straight to the beauty salon, do what I had to do. And I left there and just scouting about downtown again. And I thought I seen, I went into Singers and they're on the, um, the second floor. They had a nice salon in there. I said, man, I sure would like to work in there. <laughs> so I go to personnel, make applications, and next thing I know, I was getting a phone call from them. So Singers hired me, and I had a few problems there. The problems there were, you know, was, was customers sometimes. They were, they were really resistant because they thought by me being black, I didn't have the experience in cutting and handling their hair. I had this one lady. She, uh, I had shampooed her and cut her and gave her a beautiful style. And she just wasn't pleased. She just wasn't pleased. I just, she thought that. So I told her, I said, listen, if you're unhappy, I didn't do it for the money. Go back to the uh, cashier and ask the cashier if she will refund your money. And, and she did. So that solved that problem for me. But after I, I got those places integrated, then uh, it was always something to do. If you were downtown Dallas, it was always something that you could find to do, especially if you were fighting for the rights of freedom for everybody. And that's basically what I was doing. It, that it was something that I don't guess that sometimes I wasn't conscious that, you know, it just came natural as certain things that, that I feel that some of us are chosen by God to do certain things. And as we get into the details today, you'll find that a lot of these things just happen naturally. I was talking to my cousin this morning before I came here, and I was telling her, I said, you know, I got a lot of people down there, but a lot, they are not, all, not too many black people. I said, oh, <laughs> problem I'm going to have is, is relating because, you know, they don't have a lot of experience with, with picketing and, and uh, racial discrimination. I said, she says, oh, don't worry about that. You can handle that. She said, because, <laughs> you know, you were there. You were hands-on. And it's the people who were hands-on that can really relate to it. Uh, those who who uh, sit on the sideline and those who has never been discriminated against will never know. Let's go back to May of 1964 before Piccadilly became a full-blown civil rights protest with with singing and, and demonstrations and arrests it really just started with you one man on Commerce Street who was hungry. Right. Tell us that story. Well that story was one evening I had, again, I had just left the draft board. I decided, well, I think I'm going to the military. And I always wanted to be a, a pilot, fly airplanes. And I wanted to be a lawyer. And so I went to the draft board and I talked to some guys in the uh, Air Force office. And one of the captains just told me, he said, listen, if you volunteer, I guarantee you, you can fly the, you can fly the F-14s like you want to. And if you want to go to school, you can go to school. You can get your law degree right in here. If, if you spend the time in there doing so. So I left, left that draft board. I was the happiest little brother you ever seen. <laughs> whistling and kicking, whistling and kicking. All of a sudden, I'll, I'll see this restaurant. I looked in, and food was looking good. They had these buffet lines running across there, and people were just lined up. And I said, I think I'll join them. I think I'm going to eat there today. So I just skipped right in. And I got there, and I got in the line. And here comes this guy from around the counter, big butcher knife in his hand, too. And I, I'm thinking that maybe he's just going around to cut some meat or something, you know. I ain't paying him no attention. I'm, I come to eat, and that was it. And he said, you get out of here. I stopped. I looked. I said, 
get out of here. You get out of here and get out of here right now. I've never served a nigger and I ain't about to. I said, well, I'm sure glad because that's not why I came here. I didn't come here to eat the niggers. I came here, <laughs> <laughs> I came here to have a meal. And let me tell you something. I don't plan on leaving this restaurant until I sit down and have a meal. And he, I guess he thought that by him bullying me, I would move on very politely and leave his place. So I went over and grabbed me a chair and pulled it up to the table and sat down. And I just laid my draft papers right at the end of the table. And so, because I knew I was going to jail probably. I was going to be a fight up in there because I was going to either eat or go to jail, one of the two. So anyway, he, uh, he decided, well, I guess the best way out of this is to call the police. So he called the police and these two wicked police came. That's what I consider them as. And one of them was very polite. It's always like that when police goes into certain neighborhoods. You know, Usually they got them matched up, one good guy and one bad guy. So, uh, but anyway, when the police gets there, this one bad guy, he was, oh, he was all over me. You know, now, if you don't leave, you go in jail. So I, I keep telling you I'm not going to leave. Well, this other guy's looking over my shoulder, and he's looking at those papers. And he's like, hey, buddy, come here. You know, you need to kind of quit being hot, hot-headed and sell in. That guy's got some draft papers sitting there. I don't know exactly if he's being drafted or not. But, you know, you, we better call some brass down. So they called the big brass down. It was big enough where the chief came. The chief came and he brought uh, sergeants along, a couple of sergeants along with him. And they came in and talked to the manager. Then they came over and they talked to me. And they asked me if I would leave. I said, no, sir. He said, well, if you don't leave, you're going to jail. I said, yeah, that's what he told me when, when they first got here, <laughs> that I was going to jail, you know. And if I didn't leave, I sure as hell was going to jail. I said, so I'm not leaving. Now, if you go back and you tell him that he's violating my civil rights and my constitutional rights as a citizen, you go back and tell him that he can serve, if he served me, then yeah, I'll leave. But if he don't, I'm not going to leave. And you also tell him that I will be here until he decides to serve me and decide to serve people of all kinds and all colors. And so he, he decided, well, I ain't going back, back and forth, so we got to decide on how we're going to do this. So finally he did go back over and he talked with him and tried to reason with this guy and this guy was just like, no. I ain't sued. Well, they take me, pick me up, and take me out, because I wasn't walking out. Took me out, sent me in the backseat squad car, took me to jail. We get down to jail, they go in the back. And, uh, they were back there talking, and I heard them talking and plotting back there. And they, their whole thing was to scare me, get me f scared, frighten me, and that I would just leave. So, this one guy came out, he had his pistol, had his gun in his hand, and he's a sergeant. And he puts it here. And I just sat there, you know, okay? And so he goes back inside, and I heard him tell the chief, he didn't even flinch. He said, that SB is crazy, I can tell you that much. So anyway, chief came out and told me, he said, Mr. Barnack, you can go home. We don't have any charges we can file on you. I got up, I said, thank you. And yesterday, when we were there at that city hall over there, that one that we went in was the uh, ramp that would always lead out. The commerce ramp was the one that always led in. Well, I just took that little commerce ramp because I was in a hurry to get back down there before he closed. So I took that little... <laughs> Commerce wrapped and just came right straight back up and took Commerce and went right back down there, went right back in and sat down. Boy, was he, was he hot. 
<laughs> nah, the police has got to come back. So the police comes back. I said, Mr. Broadnax, I thought we told you not to come back down here. I said, I didn't hear that part. <laughs> and even if you did, I'll be here. I told you I would be here until this gentleman learned to serve all mankind. Just that simple. Well, they picked me up, take me back to City Hall. Now, by now, this guy decided, well, I guess I'm going to have to close. But when I get back down there, when they turn me loose, he had closed up. But the press had gotten there, and I had an opportunity to give about two good interviews, and they were major local channels. And Miss Juanita Kraft, she happened to, happened to see it, and she called me. And she said, Mr. Broad Nexus, well, she said, would you do me a favor? I said, what's that? She said, would you come over? I want to talk to you. Because she knew that I had been involved in some more demonstrations before then. And uh, so I told her I would. And uh, I went by. And so she told me, she says, are you serious about what you're doing? I said, yeah. She said, do you know how these white folks here in Dallas is? I said, I sure do. So she said, well, if that's what you really want to do, she said, let's get together and let's do it. She said, when are you going back down there? I said, tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock. She had this big smile on her face. She said, well, I'm going to make a few phone calls. And when they, when they get there, I'm going to tell them to look you up. And so they all came, and it was a crowd. It was a crowd. And then there was some who apparently told me that they had seen it on TV. And that's what they were waiting on, somebody to take charge. And about, I got there at 7 o'clock that morning. And around 1 o'clock, we had something like maybe 350 people in line. And that's how that movement there got started. And he, the guy who, who owned the place, and then it, it was a surprise to Dallas and its leadership because Dallas, that was the first time that Dallas had seen that type of movement taking place. They were used to, we had uh, a group of what we call was a black ministerial allowance. And they, they had, these were some of our major uh, churches and some of our major leaders. And they could pretty well, on Sundays, speak to their congregations and, and they would follow suit or whatever they told them. And so what happened from there is that they came out and they were protesting against us behind the curtain, not out front, than the ones who were in the lines out there cussing us out. And out of that case, I, I, that's when I got my first case filed against me, me and Reverend Allen. It was a $250,000 lawsuit came out of that because some of the things that I said about them, I called them Uncle Tom's, cowards, and anything else I thought about them. Because, and at that point in time, you know, I, I realize now that I shouldn't have took that route at them, but it was, you think about being in Dallas, Texas, one of the last major cities who decided to, to integrate and hadn't even thought about integration and all around us and all over the world, things was taking place and Dallas was sitting here like a turtle and was doing nothing about their problems. You know, we had, we had, we had problems with the school system, we had the, the police department, and I guess I can go on and on with places that at that point in time that we just picketed because each day we could find a place that we could go to picket or go sit down and negotiate and we would sit and those who negotiated with us good yeah. those who didn't the picket line would be there and Let's talk a little bit about your strategy when you would, when you would picket, particularly uh, Piccadilly. I know that you would line up 
uh, around lunchtime, and what would happen? You'd get refused service, and what would you do? We would go back to the end of the line. And you would make conversation when you were refused service. Tell us about that. Well, <laughs> sometimes it just depends on, <laughs> on what was said, and, and it was sometimes it was a, it gets kind of it would get kind of nasty. You know, you got guys who want to spit on you, and it's like, don't spit on me, okay? And because if you do, there's a consequences for it. And uh, Reverend Allen was, he and I was always close. And Reverend Allen, he used to tell me all the time, he says, man, I keep telling these people not to hit or spit on you because you're elevated on the hallway upstairs. <laughs> now when it comes to hitting and spitting, so he would, you know, he was, he was, always, he was always covering my back and I had to cover his a lot too. <laughs> but know. the goal was always to slow down traffic and cause Piccadilly to lose money. To lose money. To lose money. That was the whole, whole major idea. He was, he, 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 he was under the impression, I thought he had sat there for so long and actually got away with that type of demonstration, uh, demonstration downtown and had gotten away with it for so long until he thought that, you know, it was, and that he wasn't the only one with that attitude. Dallas was full of personalities like that. Uh, and he was under the impression that he could actually sit there and get away with that. And if he was there right now, he probably would too. But I, uh, to tell you, make a, a, another thing, a story about it, is I ran into him in, in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. And I was down there at, at the racetracks and I go down there now and I like crabs. And we go down and say eat a lot of crab legs. And I was sitting over, over eating, and look, and there he was. And on the other side of the street, I saw a big old Piccadilly sign out restaurant. I told him, I said, I want to go pick at you. He's all clear. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I learned my this lesson. This is years later. This is years later. Yeah. This has been about five years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Piccadilly was was one of our major events downtown. The uh, Dallas Police Department, they, they were some of the very last to, to want to hire blacks, and they were very, very abusive in certain neighborhoods. You know, I could sit here and tell you some of the things that I saw with my own eyes in the area that we were in. I was raised in that area that we were in yesterday, and that's how why I got emotional by when we got to Miss Kraft's home because we did a lot of plotting about what we would do and how we would do it and what directions we would take over there. And Reverend Allen's church was two of the places we did basically all our plotting out of. And uh, I had seen over there with my own eyes and, and I had been stopped so many times by a lot of the uh, police in the uh, Dallas Police Department. And the way that they conducted themselves, it was, it was horrible. Uh, a good example is one day I was there in a 7-Eleven store. And the kid was wrong. He came in and robbed the store. But the police was just right across the street. And when the kid robbed the store, he ran out. And when he saw the police, he did a, a right turn to the corner. And the police don't know what he done, but I guess he kind of figured that, well, he done robbed the store. And he got out and shot him in the back, he killed him. And I saw that. And at that point in time in the movement, those things would often drift back through my mind. And I was saying that, well, maybe we need to change. We need more black policemen. People can relate to this neighborhood. Sure enough, <coughs> we came down and talked to the chief and Governor Allen and I and some of the other leaders. And uh, they agreed to make the changes if the right qualified people were qualified. 
and there were they started then uh, hiring blacks on the police department and they were what 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 happened though is there were two guys that there had, had been there that had been there for for a few years and they would use them and send them in the neighborhoods to try to make people think that they had black police officers um, on the Dallas Police Department. Well, we knew better. And the first two that they hired, I was one of the first guys that they arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I had a traffic ticket downtown and forgot to pay it. And it was about, well, I guess about three or four days old. And he only Stafford, that was their name, stopped me. And he came back to the car, he told me, he said, Clarence, I said, what? He said, man, you got a warrant out. I said, a warrant? He said, yeah. He said, you got a ticket? I said, oh yeah, man, I sure do. And, and I was headed to a demonstration then. And I told him, I said, well, you're headed to a demonstration. He said, well, if I let you go down, and you didn't already tell me you headed to a demonstration, he said, I lose my job, you know that, you know, and he was teasing. But anyway, they were the first one that taking me off to jail for a ticket, a traffic <laughs> ticket. Now, you think about a traffic ticket. And yesterday, they, they stopped a guy yesterday. I was watching on news, and he had a, had a gun in the car with him. And I had a traffic ticket. He could have very easily said, well, okay, <laughs> make sure you get out and take care when you get out of that line this evening. <laughs> but he had to do his job. Let's talk for a moment about what you have pinned to your jacket there. I want to zoom in on that ribbon there. It's, uh, it's a quote from John F. Kennedy from his inaugural address, Ask Not What Your Country Can Do For You. And you also held up a sign. Here it is. Did JFK die in vain? All of this, the Piccadilly, was taking place about six months after the Kennedy assassination. What motivated you to include these references to President Kennedy in your, in your activism? Well, uh, President Kennedy losing your mic there. played such of a major part in getting Congress to uh, encouraging Congress, and he were a civil rights bill, civil rights act. If we had never had a president like John Kennedy and his brother Robert, we'd probably be still fighting for some of the basic rights that we're fighting for right now. And then I felt that I'm sitting thinking, like, you know. When you, when you day by every day, you're in the streets fighting for justice and equality, and some of the same justice and equality that we have presented to them, and then they come into my city. And he gets murdered. And so I said to myself, well, what do you expect? What other place could it have happened? And, you know, we still sit quietly and idly by, and you got people like me who says, well, what other place could it have happened? Well, I don't mean that derogatory. I just mean that there was so much hatred, uh, and I was in the middle of that, and I could see it, then and I, for, for no reason at all, somebody comes out of the clear blue and assassinates the president in Dallas, state of Texas. And you have to, you have to, to know about some of these areas and about some of the people who lives in them and who are involved and also involved in the power structure because we have people in key positions in this city and, and in and around it and about it, mm, politicians that, uh, you know, as a young man said yesterday, they, they, are, they are some of the most racist politicians, hid politicians that you can find in the United States and they're right here in the city of Dallas mm -hmm. and throughout the state of Texas. I, uh, a good example as you can leave here, and I have a home property in East Texas, and I can tell you some stories about that. 
uh, and being a fire chief, I, uh, the opportunities of being able to move around there, but we'll, we'll get to that later. We got, I, uh, t go t ahead. Tell us about when you met Dr. King. Uh, I met Dr. King at the airport here in Dallas. Uh, we had invited Dr. King in to, to speak. And again, we'll go back. So you can see why I called the Black Ministers Alliance, some of the names that I called them. And they, uh, the, the power structure didn't want Dr. King here in the beginning. And then we, we've got the Black Ministers Alliance fighting harder than the back black than the uh, power structure to keep him out. And we we're saying, come on, brother, we got your back. And he gets in, he gets to the airport, and we get all these different uh, threats, and we don't know if they're real or not. So we don't want him to get assassinated. So he gets back on the plane and leaves. But I had some more opportunities of, of, of meeting him, too. There afterwards, uh, and uh, Dr. King was, to me, it was just like he and I sit there talking. He, he he knew what it was like to to uh, walk into a school, I guess, and and a segregated school, and I guess he was like I don't have to guess about it. If if he saw things that he didn't like. He was was a man that was willing to give his life to change for it. And those are the kind of people that I've always had contact with. Not that it was I was trying to, but that in the lifestyle that I had chosen, then they were just I could be in airports uh, if I was on an airplane. Or just sitting in a restaurant. Usually, uh, I don't know. I had that smile on my face, or the personality. They would always come over and sit down. And in most cases, I didn't know who they were, uh, and introduced themselves. And that's how I had really had a golden opportunity to meet Dr. King, uh, Nelson Mandela. You met Muhammad Ali at the uh, Black Power Conference in Philadelphia in 1968 yeah. because by that time we should say, uh, moving on to the 60s, you became involved in the Nation of Islam and went to the Black Power Conference. Tell us about that. Right. Well, you know, Muhammad Ali, he was, he, they always said his mouth was bigger than mine. <laughs> so, <laughs> Muhammad Ali, he was, uh, we had, it, 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 really it was, uh, we were having a beauty culture convention, and uh, there were a lot of events going on there. And I'm on the, on the uh, elevator going upstairs and up to my suite. And we talked, and we got together and spent a lot of time together. And that's how I had an opportunity to meet Muhammad Ali. Uh, would you say that you became more radical in the latter part of the 60s? I guess you could say that. I have always been one that, that uh, don't hit on me, don't spit on me, curse me, do anything, you know, talk about me, just keep your hands in your pocket. Because usually uh, I'm not going to step too far over the borderline. And at that point in time, even as of today, if, if you see me and if, if, if I'm, let's just say I walked into a restaurant today and there was something that I didn't particularly like about that rest, restaurant or how they treated me in there, then I will express myself. I'll let you know. And I'll let you know that I won't be back. But uh, you got people, and this happened to me just about two weeks ago. I was in Longview, Texas, and this old white guy, he, my wife and I, my niece and nephew, we stopped to have, have uh, dinner that evening. 
and I was standing there holding the door and when I got ready to go in the door he walked right over me as if I don't I don't see you and I just stopped him I said hold it you know I don't mind holding the door for you but damn if you're gonna walk over me that ain't gonna happen so you just wait and I guess he looked and he decided well okay and I held the door for his wife and his, his kids to go in but it was we still got a lot of some of the old acts of racism that still exist and then there are certain ways that you have to just deal with it I don't like to deal with it anymore I just try to avoid it and keep going because in 2013, if we have not learned a lesson, then we will. As one of the surviving voices of the civil rights movement, as we move into next year marks the half century of Piccadilly, do you feel the burden of history to communicate your story, to share it with young people? I do it every day. I do it every day. I have a, 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 a great young, young following from kindergarten up and uh, the thoughts of, of, of this generation that's why I, I today that's why I say to America you should have listened to me you should have listened to us because this generation that you're dealing with today they have no fear and another thing is they're not going to be denied and I encourage them. Uh, you know, I'm one that encourages them, uh, and I let them know that they always got a stool to sit on. And so, but yeah, we have. And and what I like about this generation, it's it's not uh, black or white anymore. It's it's about America. I want to leave uh, plenty of time for questions. If you have questions for Mr. Broadnax, um, please raise your hand and we'll uh, make sure we capture it on camera and everything so we can be part of the collection. Yes, yes. sir. I, I was just wondering, um, Bill Cosby has made comments in the press a lot lately, and I wondered if you wanted to comment on Mr. Cosby or uh, his philosophy about today's uh, African-American youth I'm, I'm saying this jokingly too. I read some of his comments, and sometimes I think he'd be smoking a little dope. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, Bill, Bill, but I disagree with some of the things that he say. But you won't hear me uh, uh, disagree with uh, to the extent the way uh, if Bill and I was sitting here together, <laughs> that uh, I wouldn't put my arms around Bill and let him know he's still my brother. I've read some of them, the, and I, I don't know where he got lost at and with certain things that he say, but uh, you know, anytime that you dealing with a people, I, and I thought about this real, real deep last night. You, when when you look into the life of a black man and a black woman in America, you have to you have to reference your looks back to slavery in this country. And people often wonder why the conditions still existed in South Dallas, from what I saw yesterday, is because some of us have never been able to leave slavery behind. And it's because of lack of education. And it's not their fault. It's not their fault. Because if you'd have stood where I stood and been with my shoes on your feet, going into these different institutions and fighting for quality education. When you see what I see and came from where I came through that system, when they say, we got to learn to lift our own selves up by our own bootstrap. Some of us don't have no boots to put on. So I tied mine, okay, and decided that Nothing would stop me. No nothing. I was at, at the age of 11. Uh, we were going to a fair. My dad was taking us. 
from Carnac to Marshall. And it was probably one of my first bus trips too. Uh, and we got, we got on the bus and the bus driver told me that I couldn't sit on the front seat. And they had a, you know, a long seat. I don't, know, I don't know if you ever rode the bus back then. They had those long seats there. And he told me I had to go to the back. But dad then was already sitting back there somewhere in that area. And my daddy didn't like it. And I could tell by the look on his face, he didn't like it. And he knew that I, I was just sitting there rocking on that front seat because <laughs> I wasn't on the move, man. <laughs> Till daddy told me, he said, get up, boy, come over back here where we are. And I did. And he explained to me that, you know, that was the problem. And from that day on, I saw what daddy wanted to do. And so I, I took a liking to that. And so, like I say, but slavery left a lot of minds as of today unconditioned. Because when you sit down and you look at these neighborhoods and you go in and the resources that should be put in there is not being put there, you see? You got, we have, we have grants and we have different bonds. And, and a good example is I, uh, not, when I came in the first one in the business with these two young ladies, we would try and get loans. And we couldn't get loans. But Vidal Sassoon, his boys could come into town and open up salons and they could get two or three loans. They got salons all over town. So I'm wondering why is it that they can get all these grants? And our children can't get in the grants. And that's why I say today, you know, that the grants that, that I would imagine my daughters and, and as long as he on, I'm here on the face of the earth, uh, are filing for, we don't want to be denied them rights no more. We want those grants. And we're going to demand them. And I think America better have given it to us and quit making excuses. Question over here. I noticed in almost every single photograph, you were the only one wearing sunglasses. And I wondered if that was part of your signature style or if there was a reason. Can't you tell that was my style? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cute derby that I had on. Yeah. I had it on every day. It would be sweaty. I'd just stick it right on. Temperatures are just like they are out here right now. I put it right on. Never missed a day. And if I was in jail, as soon as my feet hit the ground, I put my little derby on. Before they locked me up, I tell them, take care of little hat my shades. <laughs> Earlier, this group, I know, looked at the uh, SCLC handbook for civil rights activists. And I remember when we first met and did our first oral history in 2006, I showed you that handbook. And, and you kind of chuckled and basically said that when you're, you know, in the field and when you're doing your activism, you really can't pay attention to rules like that. Can you talk a little bit about that? I kind of refresh my memories. What rules were they? Uh, about what to dress, how to dress for a civil rights demonstration, what to do if you get arrested. And you looked through it, and I remember you chuckled a little bit and said, no, no. that's not really the way we, we operated. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I think somebody uh, made a remark yesterday was uh, that the people who were demonstrating were, they were, uh, they, they, they kind of didn't know how to sit down and negotiate and relate. And I'm saying, we didn't have time to sit down and negotiate and relate. Hell, we had to get up and put on what we had on and go to work. And, and, and those who, who were there and out there, the, uh, they were, 95% of them was doctors and, and lawyers and, and nurses and secretaries. They were leaving up taking their lunch breaks and leaving their jobs and, 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 and coming and getting in the picket line. And that's that in the sixties, that was the kind of movement that we had. And as I said yesterday, we put a lot on the plate, a whole lot on that plate. Uh some of those guys coming to picket line, listen, they with old blue jeans and knees out and some of everything. But you'd be surprised what we're here under those blue jeans. So when you get back in that little room with Miss Craft and ask 
and we would sit down and we would plot and program our next move. Those guys had some of the greatest ideas about what we needed to do and how we needed to do it. And we would consolidate those ideas and those thoughts and put them together. And we, we, would, we would make a move. And that's today what you see in Dallas is that movement. There are guys like, I can sit here and name them and, 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 and you know, like Miss Juanita Kraft. Al Lipson played a major part. Uh, there was uh, John Wilder Price. You know, John and I disagree on a lot of things, but I love John. John's wild. John don't take nothing. I love John, you know? And a lot of people downtown don't like him because he's outspoken. But that's not really their reason. They know they can't hit and spit on John and work right, just working like they can a lot of guys. And if you look at that system and the way it has worked, and just, you know, I'm, I'm just calling it like it is. 95% of the blacks who were on city council and was in key positions were in prison for some of the same crimes that other people committed. You know, if in same positions, people do things that they should not do. And when it comes time to to uh, discriminate, they, they discriminate and get away with it. But that's why I keep my hands out of the tilt. I keep everything on top of the table. So when you come look at my records and you come look at my underwear as they clean, <laughs> okay? Clean. So go on with that. I don't want to hear. You got some money in your pocket, you want to put it in this program? Put it in. Keep your hands off my daughters and off my children. I love them. Don't touch them. If you do see me first, uh, those are rules that I laid down in the school system when they integrated the school system. I found out that in integration just has not worked. It has worked to an extent. That's why I said we, we, at that point in time, we put too much on the table. And there were a lot of uh, people who were not used to that racial change. They, they, you, you throw a bunch of uh, noisy black kids in, in, a, in, a, uh, in an environment with a young white teacher, and she, she has, she, she's had no spare experience at all in that neighborhood with those kids. It's hard for her to relate to them, real hard. And the reason why I know that, I go back to hand on hand. I worked security, and I just took that job for the experience of it. This has just been about five years ago at Bishop Don High School here in Dallas. And when I took that job, I, I was, they begged me to take it. They offered me a good salary to take it. I didn't even want the salary. There was a young lady that was an assistant pastor. She knew me, and she knew where my heart was. And so she called me, and she said, uh, both of my girls played softball. And that's, that's, how, that's how I know that this thing that, that of uh, racism exists just as strong today as it did in 1964. In 1958, uh, because I, I raised my girls to love and to have a clear understanding of what's going on around them. And read your history. Go back. I said, and read all the black history you can. Read it. Because eventually it's going to come around and you want to be able to relate and communicate with it. And so, and what, it, what, is, what has happened, uh, black history was left out for so long. And it left some of us just stalled, just stacked to where, as far as race, black and white kids, and putting them all in the same classroom together, it was a problem back then. And now our schools have become totally segregated again, just like it was in the 60s totally segregated. And those were some of the problems, my evaluation of it. Those were some of the problems. That, that's what happened. They, we didn't have the training programs to where we could put 
teachers in to where when we integrated those schools, they would be able to relate. And so that there's another problem that we have today. I know I know some of you all probably disagree with me, but that's 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 quite well too. <laughs> but uh, uh, mine has built pretty well on a solid foundation, DNA in the system and all. You made reference to this, and I think it's an extreme, a really good point, this idea that the generation that exists today, and I would kind of like to think of myself as part of that, right. it doesn't really see it as black and white. And many young people are no. very active, want to be very active and believe in civil liberties and rights and so forth. But there is a color barrier. How do white students or you know white teachers show um, to the black community that, in fact, they do champion those rights, and they want to go forward and move towards those and champion other civil rights as well. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's a barrier that white people can't be part of the NAACP and, and go to these protests and marches and show, we get it. This is a new generation. We want to move forward with you. Well, believe me, there has, 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 has never been uh, discrimination on our part in NAACP and none of the other organizations that I were, uh, that I were affiliated with and still affiliated with. White people does not come to those organizations because it's out of fear because they don't want to. And another reason is, is you know, when, when they sit in their living rooms and they talk to each other, they, those are some of the things that they should discuss among themselves or what they see that's happening and work on those things because that's where racism began right there is me I go the that's Ku Klux Klan's having a rally and they invite me they just messed up I'll be there <laughs> I'm just gonna have a gun on I'm gonna be rotted up now I'm not going empty handed I'll be there <laughs> believe me yes I want to kind of piggyback off what she asked right. um, when you were uh, starting with the Piccadilly and some of your activities before that did you have a sympathetic white? Uh, did you have sympathetic whites with you? I mean, were there? You know, we hear that Dallas was sort of a mix of liberal and conservative. How many uh, sympathetic whites were there with you? The vets and the movement there in that line? Yeah. Oh, getting at Piccadilly. Fifty percent. About half of them. Oh yeah, fifty percent. Fifty percent. That that's why I was just telling her when we marched on Washington. Look at that. Look look at that. At Dr. King's funeral, look at that. Okay? What we have to do is start reevaluating our thoughts and our ideas. Go on facts. Go on what you see. Okay? I sit and I listen to people in the press and I observe they in a lot of cases they, they show what they want to show. They tell you what they want you to know. Most of mine is hand on. I was there. I saw, and I, uh, I, 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 I marched there, and, and, and I, got, I had an opportunity to, to meet the people and get their ideas and their thoughts because I like to talk. I talk too much sometimes. <laughs> By me being a part of that history, I can relate to it. And the things that I say, are indisputable because they happen. I was there. I can prove that I was there. Show proof. So I had a bit, I had a friend of mine tell me one time. He said, "You know what, Clarence? You always talking about the movement. He's me and him real tight too. You ain't no more marches, no Piccadillys, and nobody." He said. <laughs> he said he he got home that night. And he, he went on uh, YouTube, and he said. He, just, he, he was just being curious. So he flipped and he seen this guy in this little derby hat. He said, damn, that looked like Clarence Ball Max, he told his wife. <laughs> he said, come here, Melville. Who that look like? He said, she said, Clarence Ball Max. He said, it is. But I just got through telling him he was lying. He had to pick up the phone and call me and apologize. <laughs> <laughs>
the uh, panel discussion that Clarence did with the Reverend Earl Allen, moderated by Bob Ray Sanders here in 2008. That is on our YouTube channel. You can watch that entire program, and you can look for this living history on our YouTube channel at some point in the future. We have time, I think, for one more question before we wrap up today. Yeah. Yes, sir. Miss America, and I have a hard time explaining to my students. There's a Miss America contest, and there's a Miss Black America contest. Now there's these dating services, and I just saw recently, now there's one just for black people. Is that a good thing, bad thing? Is that racism? Is it racism? That's what I'm asking. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that, that you know, nowadays, and the thought that I see of a uh, this generation is that some people will look at it as racism but I look at it this way if if I wanted to to organize an organization and I just wanted to say it was a uh, you know this is Clarence's uh, black playhouse you know and it's, it's not segregated if you want to come if you call me and say to me, well, Clarence, this sounds real racist to me. I, I, I would ask you why. And then probably ask you if you wanted to be a part of it. But the reason why a lot of people look at it that way is because they, and I, I'm, 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 I have to say it this way too, they have held us out for so long. And they, they you know, it looks like reverse racism. But I'm almost for sure if you would all those organizations they would tell you just what I'm telling you now no we're not playing a racial card you know it's just that in the neighborhood that I live in is 95 percent black now so it's there's no way around it and a lot of people were pinned on it well you know that's that's just racism that's black racism and white racism but uh, I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't say that. But don't you think if I would start Terry's White Playhouse, yeah. okay, there would be a lot of you know black people that would say it would be racist. Well, and that's wouldn't, and wouldn't even bother to call and say, "Hey, can I come to your playhouse?" Well, don't you think? Don't you think that's the way our past has been taught in America? Yeah. And so, a lot of us bring it on into the future. Mm -hmm. So you'll have blacks doing the same as whites been doing. And so, uh, situations like that, it's going to take time to change those things. But I don't, but again, I don't think it's racism. I think nowadays, and remember what I'm saying, okay? Nowadays, if we would take up on ourselves, as I just said earlier, the things that I, what I'm telling you now is communications. I, I communicate and relate to these people. I sit down and do the same thing you're doing. I say, hey. That sounds like real racist to me. You're a black man, and you know we fought for equal justice up under the same law. Now you won't tell me that you're gonna go out and you're gonna institutionalize yourself and say that, well, this is Clarence's black playhouse. Do you think that's fair? And he'll tell you, hey man, since you white, you won't join. This is what our dues is. This is what we do now. Can you play this part? You know, this is what we do. This is how we do our thing in here. And people have a right to that choice. This is America. They have a right to that choice. And it's hard to get used to a race of people who have been held back for so long. Now picking up, the, as they can say, picking up and tying their own bootstraps and moving on, and has has put racism in the past. We we don't we don't we don't look at racism anymore. We, if, when you see the movement today, this movement today, listen, we got it in gear. We got it cranked up. And we're moving forward, slowly by doing it, slowly but surely. You know, we, and I, I'm, I'm going to plug this and I'm going to shut my mouth off. We have a president, the United States of America. I have never seen a president to be treated, and I'm not saying this because I'm black, 
I'm building on facts. To be treated the way he's been treated. He has done more for this country than all of the presidents of the United States of America. He's passed more laws. He's tried to change society to where America ought to be. They cried out, we want Bin Laden. He said, I get it. He didn't got it. And you know what the, the, what, 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 what the other, other people said? Those so-called ultimate conservatives? If, if somebody else had a win got Bin Laden, other than him, they would have had him out with a gold all around their neck and with gold earrings in his ear. Okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you like it is. What we have got to learn in this country today is if we're going to survive, if this country is going to survive, we have got to love one another, both black and white. And to win this race, we're going to have to march together. Okay? I'm 72 years old. I don't know how old you are, but you know, I know there's a lot of 72 year olds don't think like I do, because I talk with them every day. <laughs> you know, they cripple. <laughs> I wouldn't walk a block with them. I'm just being honest with you. Black or white. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the time we have today. Please join me in thanking Clarence Broadnax for being here today. <laughs>